Well, folks, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you'd like to turn with me in your Bibles, also in your, your message outline, as well as on the screen, you'll have some scripture text this morning, which will, which will guide us as we have the message. Would you like to pray with me as we get ready to open up the Word of God? Father, we, we're here because we're a people in need of relationship with you. And God, we are in need of a word from you regularly, that you'd speak to our hearts about our lives, about our relationship with you. And so God, I pray that you just speak through me as your word is read, as it's taught and preached this morning, that you'd be glorified and that each person here would be drawn closer to you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, would you give me a little more volume? I'm not ha I don't have a lot of voice again this week. If you can give me a little more volume in the sound booth, I'd appreciate that. We're celebrating the Lord's Supper today. Uh, we celebrate the Lord's Supper monthly here at First Baptist Church. Uh, and we're doing it on the first Sunday of the month. And we will, except for months where we have Christmas and we have Easter, we'll celebrate them on the holidays. Yes, as Baptists, we typically call this this sacred act of worship, the, the Lord's Supper, because 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20, refers to this act of worship as the Lord's Supper. Uh, many Christians refer to it as communion. It's a time of going into prayerful communion and meditation with the Lord. Others refer to it as, as the Eucharist, after the Greek word for thanksgiving, because we thank Jesus for his body and his blood. And as we get ready to talk about uh, communion and celebrate communion this morning, would you stand with me? We'll honor the Lord by reading his word together. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, and we'll end with verse 32. The Apostle Paul tells us, For, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. The Lord's Supper is our most sacred act of worship. Uh, scripture uh, describes the Lord's Supper as such a sacred act of worship that it warns us that if we do it wrong, it can actually become a dangerous act of worship. And we'll talk about that a little, a little while later. Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper on the night before his death as a memorial for how he gave his life on the cross for our sins. Jesus gives us you know, very visual symbols of the bread and of the cup to stand for his body in his blood. And Jesus designs the Lord's Supper to, to draw us close in our relationship with God. When we, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, Jesus wants us to experience his presence and his voice. He wants us to experience forgiveness of our sins. He wants us to experience a deep relationship with him. And so as we, we look at the Lord's Supper this morning, we as we look through this passage, we see really three main points of application. In the Lord's Supper, it's a time for us to, to look back in history, look back at the cross and remember Jesus. So there's two times in the passage in which Jesus commands us, do this in remembrance of me. He tells us, first of all, with, with the cup, and then he tells us the same thing with the bread, that we are to remember his body with the bread, remember his blood with the cup. And if we can look at verses 23 to 25 again, um, some excerpts from that tell us the Lord Jesus, he took bread, he broke it, he said, this is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so this morning, let's, let's take a few moments and just look back 
and remember Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. And let's remember that Jesus' body was broken for us. The Psalm chapter 22, verse 18 is a, is a prophecy from the Old Testament about Jesus' crucifixion. And it tells us that no bone in Jesus' body was broken. And although no bone in Jesus' body was broken, we know that, that Jesus was really broken for us. You know, broken in his person, broken in his body, though no bone was broken. And think about what Jesus endured for us. Soldiers beat him with their fists. They pulled out his beard. They spit in his face. They put this huge crown of thorns in his scalp. And these Israeli thorns could be one or two inches long. And then the soldiers, as bullies, took a wooden staff and beat it into his head. Jesus was scourged with a special whip called a flagrum that was designed to, to take a person within just an inch from death. And then Jesus was nailed to the cross for our sins. His hands and feet were nailed to the cross. And let's remember that Jesus' blood was shed for us on the cross. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament tell us that the shedding of blood is necessary for the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, and you know, Hebrews talks so much about the death of Jesus and tells us that there's, there's no forgiveness without the, the forgiveness, without the shedding of blood, that the shedding of blood is necessary for our forgiveness. And this started way back in the Old Testament, and that's why they had this sacrificial system in the temple, which animals day after day were offered in the temple for sacrifices. So Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 tells us, as God's explaining the sacrificial system, it says, for the life of the creatures in the blood, I've given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It's the blood that makes atonement for one's life. And atonement's one of these sacred words that, that speaks about God bringing forgiveness by covering over our sins. Somehow the, the blood of those animals covered over the sins of the people. And so day after day, because the, those blood sacrifices were insufficient and incomplete and imperfect, they would have these, these animal sacrifices. And now that Jesus has come and died on the cross for us, he's offered the, the perfect final once for all sacrifice for our sins. So no, there, there needs to be no more human sacrifices. No, you know, God's son doesn't have to offer himself again. There, there needs to be no more animal sacrifices because Jesus brought that final sacrifice for our sins. And so later as we, we take of the cup and remember Jesus' blood, we remember that you know, his, his forgiveness for us is final. His work is done in that we can receive his forgiveness by simply asking him to forgive our sins. And let's remember that Jesus was fully human like us. Jesus is 100% fully God, 100% fully human at the same time. You know, God became flesh, but God became human when Jesus came, into this, came down to this earth as in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus gave up none of his divinity and took on all of our humanity. And many of us, you know, including myself, tend to stress Jesus' divine nature, maybe to the neglect of his, of his human nature. And if we think of Jesus in all of his humanity at the cross and the night before the cross in Gethsemane, we know that Jesus experiences this, this incredible physical pain, you know, beaten, scourged so severely that he was not able to carry his cross the, the full distance to the place of execution, that a bystander had to help him, uh, then nailed to the cross. We know that Jesus understands our pain. When we're, when we're at, our, our, at our worst place in physical pain, we can understand that Jesus understands our pain because he experienced horrific pain. You know, crucifixion is the cruelest form of death known to the world. Uh, the Romans perfected the cross to slowly torture a person to death over a prolonged period of time. And so Jesus suffered on the cross for six hours before he gave his life up on the cross for you and me, willingly gave his life for us because he loves us. And then think of the emotional pain that Jesus experiences. You know, one of his closest followers, Judas, betrays him. He must have felt this deep devastation when his disciples all abandoned him and just left him alone. Peter, his, the leader of the disciples, denies three times that he even knows him. He must have crushed Jesus. And then imagine the grief that Jesus experiences when his own people reject him and call for his crucifixion. Jesus knows what it's like to be deeply hurt by people that we love. 
Jesus knows what it's like to, to feel abandoned and to feel all alone. Jesus knows that, that pain of loneliness, that pain of despair. Then Jesus suffers spiritually during those last hours of his life. On the night before his death, as he goes to Gethsemane to pray about his crucifixion, he says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Can you imagine that kind of deep pain in the soul? My, my soul's overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he asks his disciples, you know, stay here and watch with me. Stay here and pray with me. And then Luke, the medical doctor, is the only gospel writer to give us this detail that as Jesus was praying, is he's in such anguish that his sweat is like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And then as God pours out the sins of the world on Jesus, you know, Jesus feels abandoned by everyone, even by God, and he quotes from the Psalms, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knows pain at, at the soul level. Jesus knows what it's like to, to, to cry out to God again and again for relief and then not get the kind of answer that we hope for. Jesus knows what it's like really to, to wrestle with God in prayer. You know, Jesus talked about God, your, your will be done, not my will be done, as he wrestled with God over thoughts at the cross. Jesus knew what it was like to you know, experience that pain when God seemed so distant. You know, Jesus prays to God and, and cries out to God, you, why have you abandoned me, God? He knows that kind of distance we feel when we feel like that, you know, our prayers just aren't getting through as we have those times of, of despair in our spiritual life. So let's look back and remember Jesus. As we distribute the bread, as we distribute the cup, let's remember his body given for us. Let's remember his blood shed for us. Our scriptures today tell us that the Lord suffers also a time to, to look within our hearts and repent. And by repent, I mean that you know, we confess our sins before God and we, we do a spiritual U-turn. We turn away from our sins. And the Apostle Paul, you know, writing under the inspiration of God's Spirit, tells us in verse 28 that, that everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. If we're not ready to do this spiritual self-examination, we're not ready to to take of the Lord's Supper today. And the Lord's Supper is not a time to examine others. It's, it's too easy to do that. We probably do that way too much anyhow in our, in our humanity. Uh, the Lord's Supper is a time to, to look within our own hearts, to examine ourselves. And I believe God wants us to examine our relationship with Him, first of all. Uh, John was a, a deacon I pastored in a multi-ethnic church in Atlanta. He was from Jamaica, and John, had, John has this wonderful, deep walk with God. When you're with John, you know you're with a person who just knows God deeply, and you experience that when you're with John. And I remember having a church meeting one Sunday night, and we were in a church that, that celebrated the Lord's Supper on a quarterly basis, and, and John wanted to speak at the, at the meeting, raised his hand, and he said, Pastor, I, I want to ask you and ask the church, can we move from celebrating communion once a quarter to once a month. And I said, John, talk with us about that. And, and he said, Charles, he said, once a quarter is not enough to enter into a deep time of reflection and examination of our souls before God. We need that on a regular basis. We need it monthly. And so many times we, you know, when we miss church, we might, if we're only doing it quarterly, we might miss, you know, communion altogether. But if we do it monthly, we have we have times to really enter into that deep examination before the Lord of examining our hearts before Him. And, and we can examine our hearts if we've got some unconfessed sin that we're just we're holding on to, or we've just not taken time to, to get right with God. It's an opportunity during the Lord's Supper just to confess our sins before God and ask for His forgiveness. And the Lord's Supper also gives us an opportunity to examine our hearts. If we, are there any areas of our life in which we're just simply resisting God and pushing God away? It's an opportunity for us to, to deal with those areas of spiritual resistance in our life. The Lord's Supper is also an opportunity to <clears throat> examine our relationships with other people. I really believe 1 Corinthians chapter 11 you know, deals real serious, seriously about our relationships with, with other people, especially other people who are a part of God's family, who know Christ. You know, so if, we're, if we come to, to worship, if we uh, come with all this relational baggage, you know, Jesus said elsewhere, he said, you know, if you, 
if you come to God's altar to worship and you know somebody's got something against you, you know, leave the place of worship, go get that right with your, with your family member or friend, then come back and worship me. You know, the relationships are, with one another are so important that Jesus says they can even take priority over worship, getting that relationship right. And so if we, we hold a grudge, if we're holding on to hard feelings, it's, it's time to ask God to help us let these things go. If we're holding on to anger and bitterness and resentment towards somebody else, it's, it's time to just bring that before God and ask God to bring healing to that relationship. You know, when, when we confess to the Lord, it doesn't really matter if we're right or wrong. What matters is the relationship's out of sorts, and we need to ask God to bring some healing to those strained relationships. And bitterness, when we hold on to it, it, it becomes a poison in our souls. And it, it takes root and somehow, uh, you know, gives the devil an opportunity to work in our lives when we hang on to bitterness. Getting our hearts right with God is essential to the Lord's Supper. And getting our hearts right with one another is too. And listen to, to verse 29. Uh, and the Apostle Paul, he's using a play on words here. He, he says, for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment upon himself. And Paul's using a play on words. In one, in one sense, there's, when we take of the Lord's Supper, we, we recognize the body of Jesus Christ. We remember his body crucified on the cross. And then we know scripture also uses uh, the body of Christ metaphorically to refer to us, to refer to, to his people. And this is the only time in this passage when Jesus, when when Paul talks about the body of Christ, he doesn't pair it with the blood of Christ. And I really believe that's because Paul's using this, this play on words here to focus on our relationships with one another. That when we take of communion, our relationship with God's paramount, but our relationship with one another is essential also. We don't, we don't go into the Christian life alone. We go into it as a community of believers. That's why you know the church family is so essential. And so scripture here talk, tells us here that you know, we need to recognize our relationships with one another, this spiritual body of Christ. You know, we're, we're supposed to be the, the presence of Jesus, the body of Jesus here on earth. And that's why I spoke about communion being a dangerous act of worship, potentially, because Scripture says here, if we don't, we don't recognize the body of Christ, we're eating and drinking judgment upon ourselves. And so Paul's telling us here that communion is our most sacred act of worship. It's essential, our relationships with God, to be right with God, to have our sins forgiven by God, to be walking in a, a right relationship with God is, is absolutely essential. But our, our relationships with one another are essential too, that we've got to do everything as if possible as far as it depends on us to have right relationships with other people, and especially within the body of Christ. I've had people tell me before that, I'm so out of sorts spiritually that I'm, I'm not taking the Lord's Supper today. I'm, I'm waiting till next time I'm going to get things right in my life. Or I, I remember having a deacon friend tell me, he says, I'm, I'm in the midst of conflict with another deacon today. This was at another church. And he says, until I get that right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass on the Lord's Supper that this month, get it right with Steve, and take it next month. And I believe, I believe that kind of commitment is honorable because we, we, we take the act of communion, the sacred act of worship seriously when we say we're going to deal with our relationship with God and one another first. Then the Lord's Supper is a time to, to look ahead and rejoice. The Lord's Supper is a, a solemn, sacred time, but the Lord's Supper is also a time of, of great celebration. The Lord's Supper is a celebration of eternal life in Jesus. Jesus is crucified. He's placed in the tomb on Good Friday. Death doesn't have the victory over Jesus. The, the devil doesn't have the victory over Jesus. The, the haters of Christ, the haters of Christianity don't have the victory because God resurrects Jesus from the dead on Easter Sunday. Forty days later, Jesus ascends to heaven where he rules as king of the universe. And Because Jesus didn't stay in the grave, because Jesus is resurrected from the dead, he offers all of us eternal life also. When we take of the Lord's Supper, it's a reminder that Jesus who is in heaven right now enjoying eternity with God will bring us to heaven. We'll enjoy eternity with God also. If we know Christ, we have eternal life. So as we take of the Lord's Supper, we rejoice in eternal life. 
The Lord's Supper is also a proclamation of Jesus' return. We look at verse 26, it says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So somehow we are just taking of the Lord's Supper as an act of proclamation that Jesus has died for us. And, and because we do it until the return of Christ, it's also an act of proclaiming that Jesus is coming again one day also. The Lord's Supper is an anticipation of fellowship in heaven. You know, today we get a little tiny piece of unleavened bread, a little sip of, of grape juice to remember Jesus' body and blood. But Jesus tells us that when he returns, there's going to be this great fellowship meal in heaven for all of us. My parents, who I've lost in the past three years, they're going to be at that table. Think of my college roommate, Kyle, who committed suicide about a decade ago because he got in such a period of despair. Kyle knows Christ. Kyle's going to be at that table waiting for us. Think about your loved ones who have gone on before you. They're going to be there. The, the heroes of the Bible will be there. Imagine thinking, sitting down with Moses and Abraham, uh, Simon Peter. You know, our Lord Jesus will be at the head of the table. You know, what a day that will be. We have this great meal awaiting for us in heaven. We worship Jesus, the king of the universe. Most of the world is unaware of the lordship of Jesus. But when Jesus returns, everyone who's ever lived, um, natural or natural, supernatural, you know, the devil, the angels, um, the devil's demons, um, everybody dead or alive will, will acknowledge the lordship of Jesus. And so Philippians chapter 2, verses 9, 10, and 11 tells us that God exalted Jesus to the highest place, gave Jesus the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We worship the crucified and risen Christ, who's the king of the universe, who's returning one day to bring us home. So let's look forward as we look back and look within and remember how much Jesus loves us and that he's returning again one day to bring us into heaven. Would you bow with me? We're going to have just a moment of response as Michael leads us through a stanza of a, of a hymn, and then we'll share in the Lord's Supper together. Father, as we get ready to uh, participate in the Lord's Supper to celebrate today, Lord, I know you've spoken to our hearts. I pray, God, in this, this little time of response that you'd prepare our hearts. And Lord, if we need to make uh, spiritual commitments to you, either public or private, Lord, that we would do this in these coming moments. In Jesus' name.